One of the most iconic characters in cinema history, from probably the greatest film in history, a character known as the personification of power, influence, and respect. A master of pulling the strings of power and always getting what he wants. This is of course the iconic Don Vito Corleone from the legendary film, The Godfather. Vito Corleone had managed to go from an orphan in a foreign country, to becoming one of the most powerful men in that country. His journey is full of trials and tribulations that ended up shaping him and defining the man he would become. Even though we do get a glimpse into how Vito was able to reach the success and position he ended up in, and how he transformed into such a well-respected and eloquent individual both being feared and loved, we don't really see some of the major events and exactly how he managed to triumph over his enemies and build an empire worth billions. That's why in this mini-series we uncover all these aspects to enable us to have a better understanding of this fascinating character, while also extracting valuable lessons that we can benefit from. And so in this video we will go into depth and unveil exactly how Vito built his businesses, structured his organization, exactly how he manages to continuously grow the empire's wealth and power, but also how he was able to maintain this vast empire and hid his immense wealth from the public's view. However we will also be going deeper, discussing how the American Mafia was able to achieve unprecedented success and survive as long as it did. After the formation of the commission, Vito alongside the other Dons began working on something that up until that point had never been done before. They were going to organize crime. You were around the old timers who dreamed of how the family should be organized, based on the old Roman legions and call them regimes, the capital and the soldiers, and it worked. Yeah, it worked. And we was like the Roman Empire. Corleone family was like the Roman Empire. It was once. One key factor that allowed the Mafia to survive as long as did, especially compared to other criminal organizations, was how well structured and organized they were. In the world of the Godfather, it was primarily Vito alongside the other Dons, who had formulated this structure. But in real life it was Salvatore Maranzano who had come up with this strict hierarchical structure. It is similar or even can be said to be based on its Sicilian origins. However, later on Lucky Luciano would make a few notable changes and additions based on Maranzano's creation. At the very top of this hierarchy is the boss or the Don. The boss, as the name entails, is the head of the organization, he is the one who makes all the important decisions and is obeyed by everyone. Much like a CEO of a company, the boss oversees all the operation of the family, however delegates most of his mundane or day-to-day -day responsibilities to his inner circle, which includes his conciliary, his underboss and capo regimes. Each boss's management style might differ, some like to be more hands on ensuring their underlings are kept at bay. I want to stay close to everything. Because being on the spot, I can see trouble immediately. Trouble is like a cancer. You gotta get it early. If you don't get it early, it gets too big, then it kills you. That's why you gotta cut it out. Wish. But some others like to delegate or are less involved with the criminal operations themselves, and rather only focus on the bigger ventures. Regardless of how involved they are in the day-to-day -day operations, the bosses command respect by both their subordinates and even outsiders, who know that crossing a dawn or saying the wrong thing could have some serious consequences. And so when a boss gives an order, it better become a reality. Vito Corleone was the personification of the perfect Mafia boss. He was intelligent, he was respected, he was feared and more importantly knew how to pull the strings of power. Being the Don gives you power, authority and respect, and so, it is an extremely desired position and the ambition of any mafioso to one day reach this title. 
However, being in such a desirable position means that there is always a massive target on your back, whether it's from rival families, the police, or even people within your very own family. The boss is usually the one who is the biggest target by so many different people. Which is why the Don usually ensures he deals with his underlings, through either his consigliere or his underboss. Below the boss, comes the two other most powerful positions within the family, and the ones who handle most of the day-to-day -day activities of the organization. The consigliere is the right-hand man of the boss, he handles and organizes his meeting, reports any important information provided by the lower ranks, and communicates with the other families. The consigliere often represents the boss in negotiations or any other meetings when possible. They are also primarily responsible to provide counsel and act as an advisor to the Don, being able to talk fairly openly and honestly without any repercussions. The consigliere does not engage directly in the criminal operations of the family and does not command a regime, however they are still regarded as extremely powerful within the family and viewed as a highly respected position. However the role of the consigliere and extent of power given can differ depending on the boss and his relationship with the consigliere. The godfather, Don Vito Corleone heavily relied on his consigliere in all matters, although Tom was not as equipped with the skills necessary for him to be on the level of a Sicilian consigliere, such as Ginko Abandando, he still was however an excellent example of what a consigliere should be like. He was the perfect peacetime consigliere, utilizing his extensive knowledge of the law, and having studied in some of the most prestigious universities in the world, and combined with Sonny Corleone's knowledge of the street, the godfather was able to have an edge over all the other dons. A notable consigliere in real life Frank Costello, who was also consigliere to Lucky Luciano, when Vito Genovese was the underboss. Now, although he may have less access to the boss, they do hold arguably the more powerful position in the family, and that is the underboss. The underboss is the second in command and holds immense power and authority within the family. Depending on the family, the underboss is usually someone with blood relations to the boss. Although the level of power differs from family to family, however the underboss is usually the successor or the one who takes over if for whatever reason the boss is out of action, whether permanently or temporarily. Vito had given this position to his eldest son, Santino. And as we saw when the Don was out of action, it was Sonny's responsibility to take over and control the family. The capos or capo regimes act as the role of a captain. Each capo heads a crew or a regime. Although it does differ for each family, but a crew can have anywhere from 10 all the way to a thousand soldiers. Each family typically has two to six different regimes, however as mentioned differs from family to family. The capos are the ones who manage all the day-to-day -day activities within their designated territories and report directly to the underboss, sometimes the consigliere. The capos often have direct access to the Don and carry out the orders given to them and relay these orders down to the soldiers. The capos are the primary link between the management so to speak and the employees. Don Vito Corleone had only two capos and they were two of his most trusted friends who together had built the empire. Unlike in some other families, both Clemenza and Tessio could directly access the Don due to their years of friendship and did not have constantly go through the underboss. But Vito did not just put two of his friends in such a vital position, just as a favor, rather he knew what they were capable of and did indeed prove they were definitely the right people for the job. Both men were ferocious in battle, however extremely loyal to their Don, and followed their orders without hesitation. And now finally we have the lowest ranking members within the family, the soldiers or made men. This is the official entry point into the family. And so after taking the oath of Omerta, they are now official members in the family. These were the individuals who really got their hands dirty and carried out the various crimes the family was involved in, but even though they were the lowest ranked members so of the family, 
and who faced the most day-to-day -day risks. Being a made man came with various different perks that outsiders couldn't access. There are many different aspects and rules that is involved in maintain and operating this structure, however we'll go into more detail in a later video. As it really does deserve an entire video to explain all the different intricacies involved. So, the Mafia was structured in a way where the Don was insulated from any of the criminal activities his organization carried out. Which is why for years Don Vito was untouchable. When formulating the structure, the bosses aimed to be insulated from the crimes and activities they were involved in, so that it would seem to have no direct involvement or relation with the individuals committing these crimes. And so with the bosses seemingly untouchable, they are able to organize and manage their members' affairs without being at risk of directly being involved. And this also plays to why they were successful, as anyone within the organization that even had the thought of betrayal or turning to the police, knew that it would be almost impossible to target or even reach the bosses. So with Vito having secured his grip on power, intricately organized his empire and cemented his name as someone not to be trifled with in the criminal underworld, it was now time to expand the empire. If you consider a million dollars in cash, just finance, Following the olive oil war and the peace that had ensued, Vito began working on growing the empire and diversifying the family's sources of revenue. The Corleone family owned various legal and of course illegitimate businesses, in which both generated a huge amount of income. But the Don concealed most of his business and investments, so that only two people really knew the extent of the family's wealth. Michael states in the novel, how shocked he was at the extreme wealth the family possessed, after he had began taking over the family. The family owned tremendously valuable real estate, entire office buildings, owned a major share of two Wall Street brokerage houses, even banks in Long Island, law firms, a trucking company, and a garment district. Not to mention the actual business of selling olive oil and other food supplies. Although these were mainly used as a front to hide and launder the family's other business operations, they themselves generated and were worth millions of dollars. The Don also owned the huge Corleone family compound. Not to mention that the meeting of the five families was held in an executive's conference room in a bank in which the Don owned a part of and its president was indebted to him. However, the primary source of revenue for the family was gambling, bootlegging, and controlling the unions. For context, in real life during Prohibition in the 1920s to the 1930s, it is estimated that the smuggling of liquor was a $3 billion industry at the time, which is the equivalent of $45 billion in terms of today's money. In real life at that time, the infamous Al Capone was generating $100 million per year, in which in today would be worth about $1.5 billion. And in the world of the Godfather films, Vito would have a similar, if not larger portion of this industry, therefore making at least $2 billion per year. So in addition to all the other sources of revenue, the Corleone family must have been generating at least a few hundred million dollars all the way to billions of dollars per year, during its prominence. And it wouldn't be very far-fetched to say that Vito was a billionaire in today's terms. But with this immense wealth, Vito was buying something that very few have, but everyone craves, power and influence. Vito had no problem spending a large portion of his wealth in securing the loyalty of some extremely powerful people across the country, in which provide him with security and favors that no else could provide. He gave himself the advantage of building a network of people all across different industries and positions of government and power, to then leverage to his favor, and add to his control and influence.
Like many others in the criminal world, after making a fortune from their illegal activities they needed to set up fronts to hid their newly founded wealth. And so like many others, he had set up various shell companies, used other people's names, and used offshore banks. But his primary method of laundering his money, other than the methods mentioned, and his various investments, was of course his olive oil company. Genco Olive Oil. And at the time, it was generating a considerable amount of revenue, and so was the perfect cover. We have an upcoming video where we go into depth on the true wealth of Vito Corleone as well as the Mafia in real life. So make sure you are subscribed and part of the Culture Mafia. And comment below how much you think the net worth of Don Vito and the Corleone family really was. But money alone was not enough to maintain and grow his expanding empire, Vito utilized something more powerful than money, something that even money is not strong enough to suppress. As the Corleone family empire grew, so did its responsibilities and members. Vito was no the head of a rapidly expanding empire that stretched from Sicily to New York, all the way to the West Coast. But in order to be able to control this vast empire, he needed to make sure he asserted his leadership and had his people's unwavering support and loyalty. Yes, always, Godfather. And one of the most powerful tools he used was fear. Vito knew how to balance the use of fear and persuasion perfectly. He shaped the dynamics of a negotiation so that his opposition would be terrified if he were to be on the Godfather's wrong side, but at the same time, could flourish and prosper if he would be in the Godfather's good graces. And Vito truly was fairly reasonable, especially compared to the other dons of his time. But that's not to say that Vito was all talk, in fact he was one of the few people who was known to truly be a man of his word, so if he said something, you can bet that he will absolutely fulfill it, he always backed his words with action. In real life, fear was what held the Mafia together, it was how the bosses asserted their dominance in their families to ensure that no one would betray them. They needed to make sure that their soldiers feared them more than anyone or anything else. And they enforced it ruthlessly. But where it really mattered most of the time, and where it was constantly enforced, was towards outsiders, who would become terrified of the Mafia, and gave in to their demands. What's interesting is that, some people actually willingly partnered with these criminals and actually went to them rather than how usually it would seem that the Mafia would target these people. And the reason for this was primarily protection and utilizing their connections, but as well as the fact that they were willing to go beyond the constraints of the law to get things done. But it was also fear that destroyed the Mafia. And here's why. Once everyone from the made men, all the way to the capos began to fear prison more than the retaliation of the family, it was the beginning of the end of La Cosa Nostra. Once Vito had established his name and reputation all across New York, it was time to expand further, sending emissaries all across the country, and even abroad, securing the loyalty of both extremely powerful individuals and organizations, but also the not-so-powerful ordinary people, who would all owe the Don a favor. And this allowed him to grow his reputation and aura of power even further. Vito managed to maintain his reputation by actually fulfilling any promises and never backing down on a threat. He was truly a man of his word. People knew that if the Godfather said something, then he truly meant it, and it will happen which was extremely powerful, as it was rare to come across such an individual in the criminal underworld, where deceit and betrayal were extremely common. And it opens him up to opportunities that were unavailable to anyone else. As people wanted to do business with him, both legal and illegal, as he offered them something no one else could. That was the power of having a great reputation in his world. Although he was not praised by everyone, some just saw him as a criminal fronting an image, so he wasn't universally regarded as an honest or reputable man. However those who knew him or dealt with him witnessed who he truly was. As a leader, reputation is everything, it is the key that unlocks opportunities or wall that blocks them off.
As stated in The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, reputation is the cornerstone of power. Through reputation alone you can intimidate and win, once it slips however, you are vulnerable and will be attacked on all sides. Make your reputation unassailable. Always be alert to potential attacks and thwart them before they happen.